morning, church. I want to thank you for supporting the youth program. Um, I know some of you sacrificed, um, but also you guys put a lot of effort in making sure we all got there safe and got there happy. <laughs> we, uh, we took 20 youth, and um, it was 23 in total, but God blessed it all for his glory. This morning, we're going to be in the book of Jeremiah. The book of Jeremiah, we're going to be going over the story of the potter and the clay. It's going to be in the 18th chapter, Jeremiah 18, and we'll be looking at verses 1 through 6. You know, pottery, it's been around for a while. It's probably one of the first utensils that man made and used. And the way people made pottery 2,000 years ago is the same way people make pottery today. If it's handmade, they work with it the same way they did 2,000 years ago. You know, they would get a piece of clay, which is basically water and dust. They'd mix it together to where it becomes a soft, putty-like material. And then they would mold it, they would shape it, they would knead it. they put it together to where that clay would become what the potter wanted it to become. And you know, God used this story in the life of Jeremiah to show us how he molds us and he uses us that we become the vessel that he created us to be. Let's pray. Almighty God and Father, it's all about you, never about us. Lord, we submit to you our very hearts and our very minds. Lord, we're just so thankful that you're a God who loves us, a God who has a plan and a purpose for us. Lord, may your spirit lead us today, lead us through your word, to the glory of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As we read the story in Jeremiah, it's important that we see the three, the three parts to the story. There's the clay, there's the potter, and then there's the wheel. Please follow me as I read Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 1 through 6. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise, and go down to the potter's house, and there I will announce my words to you. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, making something on the wheel. But the vessel that he was making of clay was spoiled in the hand of the potter, so he remade it into another vessel as it pleased the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Can I not, O house of Israel, deal with you as this potter does, declares the Lord? Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. This is an amazing story. And the key to understand the story is to realize that the focus of the story is not on the clay. We're not the stars of the story. The focus of the story is not on the wheel. Our lives isn't what's the big deal. The focus of the story is on the potter. And it's how the potter takes the clay and how he puts it on the wheel and how he makes the clay useful and how he makes the clay beautiful. Because you see, if, the potter, if it's the potter that gives the clay its form, and give, gives the clay its function, you will see how dependent the clay is upon the potter. Just as much as the clay needs a potter, so us do we need God. And so we realize that if God's the potter, and our lives are the wheel, and that we are the clay, then what we're going to learn today is that with God, there's always a possibility of a new hope in my life. There's always a possibility that God can do something in my life. Just as the potter can take any piece of clay and mold something beautiful out of it, God can take anyone and mold something beautiful out of them. And God can do, do the same with your life, and God can do the same with mine. There's th three things that we're going to learn this morning. And the first thing is that God is always working on us. God is always working on me. 
In verse 3, you see that Jeremiah went down to the potter's house. And there he was making something on the wheel. Now, even though this was an actual event, I mean, Jeremiah actually went down there to the potter's house. God was using this to tell a story. And what he was telling Jeremiah was, Jeremiah, this is really symbolic. I need you to pay attention to detail. Because I want you to understand something, Jeremiah. I am the potter, and when you look at the potter working on the wheel, the potter represents me. Now, the reason why I know this is because what God says in verse 6, Can I not, O house of Israel, deal with you as this potter does, declares the Lord. Behold, like the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand over, over Israel. Now, right now, we need to realize that we're just a piece of clay. We may be thinking that we're calling our own shots. We may be thinking that we're doing our own thing. But the truth is, God has us right in his hand. God is always working on you. And God is always wanting to work on you. Isaiah the prophet said this in Isaiah 64, 8. But now, O Lord, you are a father. We are the clay. You are a potter. And all of us are the work of your hand. God has a purpose for you. God has a purpose for me. You're not an accident. I'm not an accident. You didn't just happen that before you were conceived by your parents, you were already conceived in the mind and heart of God. There are no such things, there is no such thing as an illegitimate person. In the eyes of God, all people are legitimate. In the mind of heart of God, everyone is equal. Everyone is loved. And that's why we have to remember that we're clay. Clay is soft. Clay is pliable. Most of all, clay doesn't talk back. <laughs> and the truth is, clay is really only useful in the hands of the potter. By itself, it's formless. It's shapeless. It's useless. And the truth is, we're only useful in the hand of God. We're only useful when we're in his will. And we're fulfilling the purpose he has for us. So just as the clay is useless without the potter, we're useless without God. And you know, you may look at clay, I may look at clay, and I may say, you know, clay's not really a big deal. It's just dirt and water. But to the potter, clay is everything to him. Clay is gold. Did you ever realize that mankind is the only part of creation that God chose to create with his hands? He could have spoke everything. He did speak everything into existence. But with man, he chose to mold with his own hands. That shows you how valuable you are in the eyes of God. So whenever you feel the world tells you, the world beats you down, Satan beats you down, you tell him, the creator of heaven and earth molded me and shaped me with his very own hands. He had the ability to speak me into his existence because he made me unique, because he made me with a special purpose. He molded me with his very hands. And so don't let the fact that the Bible calls you clay, um, belittle you or make you feel bad. The fact that God calls, the Bible calls God the potter and you the clay shows you how important you are to God. The psalmist Davis put it this way in Psalm 8, verses 3 through 6. When I look at the night sky and see the work of your fingers, the moon, and the stars you have set in place. What are mortals that you should think of us, mere humans that you should care for us? For you made us only a little lower than God, and you crowned us with glory and honor. You put us in charge of everything you made, giving us authority over all things. And so the clay represents us. The potter represents God. And the will 
represents our life. And the truth is, the will is what's valuable to God. Because it's the will that he uses to mold us and to shape us. And so, the, and so God has put his hands on our life. He is shaping us and he is molding us. And every day that we live, he is creating us more and more into the image of his son. Because that's your calling. That's your purpose. To show the world who Jesus is. And that's why we need to yield to him. We need to give him full authority over our lives. You know, if we don't have, if we don't let God have full authority over our lives, we're not truly honoring him as Lord. Because that's what Lord means. It means master. It means he is in charge of everything that you are. That there's no competition with your affections for him. There is total submission. And so when God has us on the will, we need to be yielding to him. And the truth is, God is always in absolute complete control of every event and every circumstance in our lives. If you look at a wheel, it goes round and round. It goes in circles. Have you guys ever felt that your life is going round and round and in circles? Well, it is. It is. Every turn, every bump in the road, God uses that. God allows that. What does Romans 8, 28 say? For we know that God causes all things to work for the good to those who love God, to those who are called according to this purpose. Have you ever asked God, why have you allowed this to happen? Why did this come into my life? I've been trying to live right. I've been trying to act right. And then this comes into my life. What are you doing? And when that happens, you know what the problem is? We focus on the will and not the potter. We take our eyes off of God and we focus on our lives. And let's remember now, the focus of the story is on the potter, not on the clay and not on the will. God works in all things, good and bad, to fulfill his purpose for us. If we will just give God time and allow him to work in our lives and to trust him to do what's best, He's always working on us. And he'll take all those things, the good, the bad, the ugly, the sad, the pretty, the beautiful, the shameful. And somehow God is the only person that can put that all together and make something beautiful out of it. And so remember, God is always working on us. Second thing we learn is that God is always wanting what's best for us. God is always wanting what's best for me. In verse 14a, in verse 4a, it says this. But the vessel that he was making of clay was spoiled in the hand of the potter. Sometimes the potter has a problem. Sometimes there's a piece of debris, a rock, an imperfection in the clay. Now, this parable takes another turn. Sometimes he's working on the clay. He's molding it. He's shaping it. He's putting it together. Then all of a sudden, he'll stop. (laughs) Because there's a mar in the clay. There's a spoil in the clay. There's an imperfection in the clay. And usually, when something's wrong with the clay, one of two things is happening. For one thing, something needs to be taken out. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a story of a preacher um, that he was preparing for this very passage. And he went to this town called Williamsburg, Virginia. Mm-hmm. And in this area, they basically do a time warp. They take things back hundreds of years. I mean, it's, it's world-renowned for that. He went to this small town. And sure enough, they had a potter's house there. So he went to go check it out. And sure enough, when he was there, the potter was turning the wheel. He was shaping the clay. 
And man, he was either making a vase or an urn or something, but it looked gorgeous. I mean, it looked sharp. Then all of a sudden, he stopped, pulled it off the wheel, pulled it apart, started mashing it and smashing it. And as if he was looking for something, he kept doing this for a while until he found something. He reached in and he threw it on the floor. It was a tiny little pebble that had gotten in there. And the preacher, he just couldn't understand why he did that. I mean, to him, it looked perfect. To him, he didn't see an imperfection. But to the potter, he knew it was there. He felt it with his hand. It wasn't the eyes that saw the imperfection. It was the intimate touch that saw the imperfection. Our eyes lie to us. Our, high, our hearts lie to us. The only one that knows us is God because he's the one who has that intimate touch in our lives. And so the preacher asked the potter, why did you do that? He's like, well, you know, I could have fixed it to where nobody would have seen it. I would have put that on the inside of the pot and nobody would have known it was there, but I would have known. And everything that I make, I give my guarantee. I give the best that I can give. And so the potter, even though it was more work, even though it was tedious, he removed that imperfection out of the clay, and he started all over again. You know what the funny thing is about sin? The strange thing about sin sometimes is that sometimes we don't even see it. I mean, we all know we have faults. We all know we have imperfections. But the funny thing about sin is that we don't always see it. Well, have you ever heard somebody say this? Well, if I know my heart, then such and such should be true. I used to say that. I used to say, well, I trust my gut. I trust my heart. It seems right. But just because I have a clear conscience, that doesn't justify it. Just because I feel that my heart is telling me the right thing, that doesn't mean it's the right thing. David, I'm sorry, Jeremiah 17, 9 says this. The heart is more deceitful than all else. It is desperately sick. Who can understand it? There's only one being in the entire universe that knows your heart completely and totally, and that's God. And there are times when God sees faults in you and God sees faults in me that we can't see. There are times when God sees problems in my life. God sees problems in your life that you can't see. There's a times, there are times when God sees a mar in my life, an imperfection in my life, a stone in my life that I can't see. In preparing for this, I read a passage in Psalms, and it made a lot of sense to me. David wrote in Psalms 19:12, How can I know all the sins lurking in my heart? Cleanse me from these hidden faults. It was David, a man after God's own heart, that said, that finally realized, God, there are faults in me that I don't even know about. There's things in my life that I don't even know about. I need you to work in my life, and I need you to take, these, take care of these hidden things. And that's how we need to approach God. We need to approach God in, cl- in complete humility. Do you remember the parable of the tax collector and the Pharisee? And their two prayers were contrasted. The Pharisee approached God, and he was praising himself, saying, Lord, I do this, I do that. I'm not like that tax collector. Look at me. And he doesn't even bother to ask God for anything. It's like he's saying, God, I have everything. I'm complete. And then we see the tax collector approach God. God, I'm a sinner. I need mercy. Have mercy upon me. I know I do not have it all together. I know that it is you, Lord, who are perfect. And though my life is imperfect, I approach you with imperfection. Touch my life. Save me. 
And so when we approach God, we need to be a piece of clay that is pliable, that is soft, that doesn't talk back, that doesn't tell the potter what to make of it. And it's the potter that sees the imperfections. He sees the changes that needs to be made. And it is only him who is able to do so. So not only will the potter have problems with the clay having imperfections, but sometimes the clay does not yield to the potter. It is no longer soft and pliable. Before, it was easy to caress and to knead. And you know what's beautiful about clay when it's soft and pliable? It shows the imprint of the potter. It shows the very touches of his hand in it. But you know, sometimes the clay gets hard. Sometimes the clay will no longer yield to the potter. And sometimes our very hearts get hard. We get so set in our ways. We get so set in what we want to do and what we want to accomplish that we become hard and that we no longer bear the imprint of the one who loves us, the one who's shaping us, the one who's created us. And let me ask you something. If somebody were to accuse you of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence in your life to prove you guilty? Would they be able to see the imprint of God in your life? Sometimes we wonder why God allows calamity. Sometimes we wonder why God allows affliction and problems to come our way. Is it possible he's getting our attention? Sometimes the potter has no other choice because the clay has become hard. The clay has become unyielding. He has no choice but to take it off the wheel and break it. And then he has to melt it down to where it's soft again, to where he can mold it all over again. And sometimes God uses affliction. Sometimes God uses problems. Because we will finally realize, hey, we're nothing without God. God, I need you. Forgive me for being hard-hearted. Mold me, shape me, melt me down. I want to fulfill your purpose in me once again. And so we need to be yielding to our Heavenly Father just as the clay needs to yield to the potter. And you know, it's all about love. The truth is, God doesn't need us. He's blessed in himself. He has multitude of angels praising him. Where he lives, where he dwells, is perfect. Yet God chooses to love us and calls us his own. And sometimes the things that we become embittered about, sometimes the things that we get mad at God about are the very things that bring us back to him, that bring us closer to him. Before I came to God, God had to do three things in my life. First, I had to be available. Second, I had to be empty. And third, I had to be clean. You know, when I came to God, and I said, God, okay, I'm ready. You can use me now. Um, my life doesn't make any sense. In fact, I'm destroying myself. God, take me. I'm yours. He said, okay, well, first, I'm going to have to break you. You're going to have to lose your identity. You know, in, in boot camp, um, when men are made into soldiers, what they do is they take those men and they break them. They break them all the way down. They take away their pride, take away their character, their personality, take everything from them to finally there's nothing left. And then they begin to build them up. They get, begin to give them courage, begin to give them strength, to where they're brave and fearless. And you know, that's what God had to do with me. There was no good in my life. There was nothing that God could use because I've, I've lived a sinful life. Sin was so habitual in my life. Sin was prominent in my life that God just loved me. He broke me. He melted me down. And then finally, when I was pliable, he began to build me up. He began to teach me his word. And he gave me his spirit. And so what's wonderful about the potter 
is that even though the clay is marred, even though the clay is imperfected, you know what he doesn't do? He doesn't throw it away. He reworks, he reworks with it. He puts it back on the wheel, and he works with it. And it's like, if it were true that God threw something marred away, I wouldn't be here. The truth is, God is willing to use anyone and everyone if they are yielding to him. And so I know what you may feel. You know, I don't know how you are today. I don't know where you're at in life right now. But if I can tell you anything, is that with God, there's always a hope. There's always a new hope of him doing something in my life. And sometimes we become so hard. Sometimes we become so unyielding that we forget that he's working in our lives. We get so preoccupied that we do no longer see what he's doing. And so what we need to realize is that God not only is always working on me, but he's always wanting what's best for me. There was a story of a kid who got his hand stuck in a vase. Now, this vase was a family heirloom. It was about 230 years old. And one day, his mom saw him with his hand stuck in there. And he was trying to pull it out. And he's like, Mom, help me. So he had his hand stuck in this family heirloom that was valuable, that was beautiful. And she tried to pry his hand out of there and it just wouldn't work. She poured oil on there. She greased him up. She pulled as hard as she could. And his hand would not come out. And out of love, she said, man, there's only one thing that I can do to resolve this. I'm going to have to break this vase. So with her loving heart, she grabs a hammer and she breaks it. And what does she see? She sees her son's hand curled up in a fist just like this. She said, what are you doing? You could have opened your hand at any time and slipped your hand out of there. What are you doing? Well, Mom, if I would open my hand, I would drop my penny. Sometimes God has to do that with us. We're holding on to a sin. We're holding on to an imperfection. Our life is marred, and we like it that way. Sometimes we're happy with the way our lives are. Even though we're no imperfect, we give up. We're in self-denial. And all we have to do is let go. And all God is trying to do is like, hey, I don't want to break this beautiful vase, but I will because I love you and I can't allow you to stay that way. And so God is always wanting what's best for us. Third thing we need to realize is that God is always willing to start over with me. Look at the latter part of verse 4. And it says this. So he remade it into another vessel as it pleased the potter to make. As Jeremiah watched the potter and he saw that the clay was marred, he realized that it wasn't the fault of the potter that it was marred. It was the fault of the clay. And though the clay was marred, he chose not to throw the clay away. He still valued it and decided to continue and finish his work on it. God will never look on your life and see it as something that he can just throw away and replace with something else. In other words, God will never regret the price that he paid for you. No matter how marred you are, he will remember the day you came to his son and said, Lord, save me. I believe in you. Cleanse me of my sin. I give my life to you. With God, as far as God's concerned, he will never forget the day that you came to him. He will never regret the price he paid for you. No longer are our lives formless because of God no longer are our lives useless. But until the day we die, until the day God calls us home, 
He will finish the work that he has started in us. And yes, we may have imperfections. We may have a stone in our heart. We may have Mars. But God sees us valuable. God loves us so much because he loves Jesus so much. And the fact of the matter is God loves Jesus so much he wanted many more like him. And so he saved us. And he created a work in us to glorify him and to show the world who he is. Sometimes the world will make me feel that I'm insignificant. Sometimes the world will view my life and call me a nobody. But God has a habit of taking nobodies and turning them into somebodies. The Bible says that he makes all things beautiful in his time. For some of us, it takes longer. But in his time, he makes all things beautiful. I don't know where you're at today, but if there's someone here who does not have Jesus as their Lord and Savior, I want to tell you something. I spent 27 years of my life trying to find life, trying to find purpose. And at the end of 27 years, I was broken. I was ashamed. I had no love for myself. God, in his great love, reached down, grabbed my life, and put me on his will. He melted me down. He gave such a great love for me that I had a will to live. And I allowed him to keep me on the will and to allow him to shape me and mold me. And so all I can say is, since God has done that to me and for me, he can do it for you. And yes, there's times when I've disappointed God. There's times when I've failed God. But God never threw me away. You know, the Bible says that God's gifts they're irrevocable. There's so many times that I feel that I've disqualified myself for so many things that God could use me for. But you know what? When God gifts you, when God enables you, he never takes that away. He always keeps you on his plan, on his purpose for you. In his great love, he will reach down and put you on his will of life. At this time, we're going to have a time of invitation And if there's somebody here who wants to approach God and say, God, come to the clay of my life. Put me on the will that you have for me. Mold me and make me into something that I can be useful for. Not only for earthly use, but for eternal use. I pray that you would come today and make that decision. Almighty God and Father, blessed be your name and all things in heaven, and all things on earth. You are the creator, the sustainer of everything. Lord, with you, all things are possible. And Father, to you, we commit ourselves, knowing that without you, we're useless. Knowing without you, we're formless. Father, we just trust that you love us enough that you will continue your great work in us, Father, we repent of our sins. We give our lives back to you. You are the potter. We are the clay. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sing, change my heart, O God, as we respond to how God has spoken to us today. Change my heart, O oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God, may I be like you. You are the potter. Clay. Mold me and make.